Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have two guests for you guys. I have Cameron Beaumont and Riley Delacroix. They are intimacy companions and BDSM providers. And they are also a real life couple. How are you guys? Thank you so much for coming on. Really great. We're so grateful to talk to with you. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're just so happy to be yeah. in space together, yeah. like virtual space. Yeah, we've been orbiting each other for a while, and now you know here we are after your your big change. Yes, my big change. Um, if uh, some of you guys don't know, uh, we were talking about the fact that I had a baby. Uh, it at the time that we were recording, which is December twenty eighth. It's been about two and a half months. But this will come out in January. She'll she'll be just over three months. And, uh, one of the things that, you know, that you guys are, are so interesting in so many ways. And one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about, and we may as well jump right into it is what it's like to be a sex worker and a parent so, because you guys are both. So maybe tell me a little bit about uh, what challenges you face in that area and why actually there may be some pluses to that as well. Yeah, I want to like preface this with like, honestly, we've actually, we have many clients um, and in the public sphere, we've actually, this is, there's a reason, Holly, like we chose your podcast to sort of come out about this because we didn't, this is the first time we've actually like, owned our milf <laughs> it's, yeah. um, well we just didn't feel that uh, other podcasts that we had been on the people were not parents and so mm -hmm. they might not actually be able to hold the totality of it or in your case like being the child of people who worked in the sex industry and so mm -hmm. we're really grateful to be able to be here and to like kind of come out in our full way like we kind of staged it over time like oh we're coming out as like a real life couple and and now we're coming out as like, oh, and we're parents as well. And so it's uh, it feels really good to be able to show up as our full authentic selves in our work and in the world. Um, I, I would say the other thing that I would say too is that um, though there can be a lot of challenges with balancing the two worlds, we have the grace of being having been supported by a lot of sex positive, especially queer community, care, you know, child care providers and things like that, because that's a that's a big logistical issue that can come up is can you get child care who you can be honest about who you are and what you do with? And we've had that throughout course and we wouldn't I mean, have been able it's to do it's really like them. it's part of the main line of our vitality honestly like everyone who has supported us through this process of of being sex workers and being parents has been understanding of who we are and what we do and supportive. and and also curious right like they're like wow what what happened last night? You know, like so interesting. Like, I can't believe like you guys are so awesome yet. Like right now, I, like to give a perfect example right now, we are sitting in a studio that our friend who's a former, um, cam girl sex worker, um, since retired, but his like an IT Wizard. brilliance wiz wizard, wizard. <laughs> she set the studio up for us and she's at our house right now watching our watching kids, our kids. <laughs> and we don't know the half about tech and all of these microphones and computer yeah. monitors and all these things but she gets it and she's also very kind to us and very kind to our children and it's like we've created a certain level of family around it where yeah. people can just understand that the work that we do is really sacred and that it also takes a village mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. who we need to be. Right. Individuals. You know, it's interesting. You're actually the first person that brought up the possible issue of childcare and being open about what you do for a living. Cause I've interviewed other um, sex worker 
parents. And that's something that just kind of never really came up. But obviously, I can totally see how that would be a challenge. You guys live in Portland, right? We, we live do. in Portland now, and we were formerly in New Orleans. And okay. um, the challenge with us in the childcare is that people often book us together, like we work together mm. as well as individually. And so if we're both going to go and see a client, like we have to get childcare. And uh, it's really nice to not have to dance around like, oh, where are you going? What are you guys doing at 1030 at night or, you know, or whatever, you know, yeah. we can just be, as I said, like be our full authentic selves and be, and be supported fully in that our community. Yeah. I mean, I, I brought up the fact that you live in Portland because I know it's a very progressive city and I've interviewed other sex worker parents who live in not such progressive areas. Like there was mm -hmm. uh, one who lived in Arkansas who ended up, mm -hmm. you know, getting mm -hmm. like the police called on her because yeah. um, somebody yeah, that was, thought yeah. that she was shooting porn around her children. Um, you know, which wasn't the case. Yeah, I mean, yeah, honestly, like this is a worry we have just doing this podcast with you. We talked about it before that. Like, mm -hmm. what does it look like when Swerfs go on YouTube? Yeah, and, and and really can't hear the message that we're saying, which is that right. we love our children, and they are not involved in this at all. Right, in the same way that you weren't harmed or involved in what your parents did when they were shooting porn you weren't standing there no you know yeah. they protected you and it was they they allowed you to thrive into the person that you are now yeah. and so yeah there was there was a certain level of trepidation for sure even just coming onto this podcast and announcing ourselves as parents because i think every layer that we have being the open and authentic providers that we are creates a level of, of of trepidation in our hearts of like well what's the outside world going to think about this and yeah. um it's it takes a really special person to be able to actually hear what we're saying yeah which is that we're not harming our children yeah that we're not no doing even, terrible things yeah do you think i mean our work is sacred and it heals people and it helps people that period you know, that's how we feel about sex work. And um, that's my lived experience. But like, I think about the ways that it helps our kids, like, I was thinking about the story that we have told our kids, and they asked us kind of like what we did. And we're kind of like, Oh, we help, uh, we do a couple things, we help adult, you know, one of our kids is really worried about growing up, because she won't be able to play as much. And she thinks that being an adult is boring and it's scary and all of these things. And so we talked to them about like, oh, like sex is actually like one of the things that you gain as an adult that you don't have as a child. And it's a way that adults get to play and enjoy each other and interact and this and that and have imagination and all of the things that you know, it, you, it looks like we don't get to do because you just see us, you know, doing chores and working and what have you. And so what we do is we help uh, other adults play and have the imagination that they can't have in their life outside of that, or help them to feel better in their bodies because they're hurting or because they don't have something in their life that they really want, you know, and that, mm. so we're very judicious and very explicit in being age appropriate, but also honest with them because that that's honest. That's what we do. I think that's so important what you say about, you know, the combination of age appropriate and honest, because sex is a continual conversation that you have to have Absolutely. with your children, because Absolutely. there are certain yeah. levels, obviously, that you address at certain ages, you can't, you know, sit your five year old and tell them about the birds and the bees, you know, like, as they yeah. get older, there's there's different things that are appropriate to speak with them about. But I also want to commend you guys, and hopefully reassure you as well that, you know, coming on this show and talking about this is important um, because it's important to discuss these things. You know, we are evolving as a society. I'm, I'm hoping, I believe that I'm seeing a shift in the way that people view sex workers and sex work. I definitely can tell you just from doing this podcast, the feedback that I've gotten from people who have really, you know, 
expanded their their view on sex work and sex workers by watching my podcast. If you go on my YouTube channel and you wade through the comments of um, she is immoral and Jesus will save you and Holly is fat, you will find comments that are like, oh my gosh, you've changed my mind about how I feel about sex yeah, workers. Yeah. I never knew that these people could be such deep, such intelligent and such well-balanced people. Like, thank you, Holly, for showing me this. And of course I cannot take credit because it's people like you yeah, who are yeah. willing to come out and speak about those things that you're helping change people's minds. And also too, we touched upon on this a little bit before we started, but providing, um, I think some reassurance to other sex workers who are also parents because sex workers are people. And so sex workers should be able to enjoy all of the many things that normal people do, which is have children and start a family you know, you're not sexual deviants, you're not criminals. And I think that sex workers, if anything, um, almost more so than other people understand the boundaries between what they do at work and how they are as parents. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of other ways that like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's okay. There's a terrible delay on this. So it's like impossible for that not to happen. No, please, please continue. Yeah. I just wanted to say that there, there's many other ways that being sex workers have even benefited our kids, you know, mm -hmm. like all of the tools that we use in work in terms of like helping people be embodied, helping people understand consent, helping people learn how to communicate about sex and about their needs, their actual true needs and things like that how to learn how to say no and have your no respected, you know, like this is, these are skills, social skills that happen in sex work. And they're, they're what we want to teach our kids because we want our kids to be good adults who have healthy relationships with other people. And those are foundational skills for people to have healthy relationships. And so it's, you know, we, part of our work, people think that people just come in and like, you know, I don't know, whatever, what, I don't know what people think, but uh, much of our work actually is teaching people how to be the, their full selves and giving them a container to do that. And that's very much what parenting is, is just creating mm -hmm. a loving, an unconditionally loving container and providing skills and being demonstrative about how to be your best self in the world. And that's what we do with our clients as well, just in a very particular realm. Right. Yeah. I mean, you find that people who generally have issues, um, who have sexual hangups, who have issues with sex, who have boundary problems are people who were raised to have a huge sense of shame around sex and who Absolutely. were not, not taught anything about sex. And, um, where it was like a big secret or was a big, like this, you don't discuss this. I can tell you, you know, like we've said from personal experience, I feel so fortunate <laughs> to have been raised from parent by parents who, um, you know, didn't raise me with a sense of shame around sex. And, you know, look like a majority of the, th when I think about my childhood, a big portion of that is not about like what my parents did for a living. Cause I always knew what they did for a living. I knew that mom and dad, when I was very young, it was like mom and dad make movies for grownups. And that was kind of like all I really needed to know. And I didn't, and then as I got older, I understood more, but again, it was never like the defining characteristic of my childhood in any way. The defining characteristic of my childhood was no, having no, parents not, who were no, present, at all. who loved me, who read me a bedtime story every night, who had Sunday, we had Sunday lunch together every Sunday, who sent me to a good school who yeah. made sure that I was, you know, engaged yeah. in sports and hobbies that I felt, um, accepted. I felt loved. I felt empowered, like all of these things. And I think about that now as an adult with it, with a daughter and how I'm going to pass those values on to my children. And it makes me realize like what an amazing job my parents did. And the fact that they were pornographers, it's just kind of what they did for a living, you know? It yeah, wasn't like, like it's, who they are yeah, as people. It's just like the wall. Like, the once wrapping, you find out, it the doesn't wrapping matter. paper. Like, whatever. I mean, I think you have a lot to say about, like, Yeah, well. I think, I think, um, 
what I can say is like, I resonate with your parents so much in just this idea of knowing that the work that we do is not always like appropriate to just like divulge onto our children, which we've never done. Um, but at the same time, we get to have great conversations um, to give you some really fun examples where our kids are still so innocent and they have no idea what we do for a living. Um, just recently, right? Like we're past the, the Christmas season and they wanted to watch the Grinch and there was this episode or this like part in, part in the Grinch that said, Oh, and all who babies float down from the sky and they just land on a porch and then someone takes care of them. And her oldest child was like, that's not how babies are made. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but like we had no further conversation from that. Like they like they're old enough to understand and have asked us the appropriate questions to where we give them the appropriate responses to say, Yes, if you want to know exactly how a baby is made, this is the thing. And I think that also, like, once you're a full-fledged teenager versus a preteen, like, you're going to be responsible for your body. And this is how babies are made. So if you don't want to have a baby when you're 16, like, here's the precautions you could take. Mm. Um, but they still, at least at this point, as a preteen, like, know babies don't come from baskets they don't come from storks and i think that's really very valuable to them and they're not shy about it they're just like matter of fact about it which i find i never had that as a kid mm. and i don't i don't think riley did either like no, we, parents, we had to figure mom, it out on our own and it was yeah. <laughs> it my was mom my mom crazy. was a midwife and she came, my my sex talk is she came in she gave me condoms and said, I don't want to be a grandmother. <laughs> I was figured out. <laughs> Here you go. Like, I was like, I was probably like 10, <laughs> you know, I was like, what? <laughs> but like, so, Holly, like I just, I'm sorry, again, I just wanted to like, you're talking about all of the benefits that you got from your parents. And like, this is the thing, like the work that we get to do, it's on our own terms. You know, like we're entrepreneurs, so there is like a lot of like background work and other work. It's not like you just show up and then like mm -hmm. that's the work that you do. There's still it's still a lot of work, but what it affords us is so much more time to be with our children, for okay. example, that then if we were both working 40 hours a week or something like that. Yeah, which is something we've done in the past, like prior to being full-time sex workers like even when we were half-time sex workers it was like we work 40 60 hours a week and our kids wouldn't see us and now we can really like construct time where we're away from people we're away from our family and then we go to do our work and then we come back and our kids aren't missing us for yeah. this monstrous amount of time. It's like, oh, mom one or mom two, they got dressed up and they left for a couple of hours and they came back and now we're all having dinner, you know, as opposed yeah. to like, oh, you know, mom had to work overtime again and now we're not all together for dinner. Like that's the difference. And that's just one of the many benefits of like being full-time sex workers as it pertains to like what our, our kids get to have from us. Right, right. What we're available for. Right. Love it. Okay. Uh, hang on tight, guys. We are going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk about uh, more about Riley and Cameron's work as uh, providers and um, their roles in BDSM. So hang tight. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. 
because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. Hello, everybody. We are back. So Riley and Cameron, um, you guys are also intimacy companions. Can you tell me maybe a little bit about how you got into that line of work and um, what kind of services you guys provide? And maybe do you guys have different roles? Because I know you work together a lot. So how does how does that work? Yeah, I, um, we actually got into the industry as pro-doms, like doing exclusive PD BDSM work. Um, and we spent several years doing that work. Um, but it, it, it just, <laughs> for instance, one of our friends said, whoa, she was a, she was like a MFA theater artist. And she said, wait a minute, you write the play, you direct the play. You act the play. Improvise. <laughs> you improvise. Whoa. All in an hour. <laughs> All you in guys an hour. are performance artists. <laughs> We're performance artists, apparently. <laughs> and um, we didn't get MFAs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it was beautiful, like, because we have, like, Honestly, if we lined up all of our former BDSM clients, they'd be like, yeah, they have created such great scripts for us and based on their needs and based on their need, their wants. And it, it was really fun and it still is very fun um, that when it became like our exclusive art, we found it to be a little like we, we, we lost ourselves a little bit. It requires playing a role oftentimes and it yeah, might not whether, be who you, yeah. who you are. Whether you're a teacher, whether you're a headmistress, whether you're, you know, a mommy, whatever, in those realms, like what we felt sad about and when we sort of came to reckoning with is like, but what about just being ourselves? Like, because we're cool people and we want we want to like just be able to be ourselves and hang out with people because we're cool people not because we like put on this mask and we become this nun or this teacher or no, this, that's it's still you know, fun it's, still it's, fun it's totally to fun and we still do it all <laughs> the time um but it like we wanted to intersperse that i guess with just being ourselves and so that's what led us into just like straight up companionship without a level of BDSM. Cause also a lot of our clients were very reluctant to BDSM and so wouldn't, weren't really down for it at all. Um, but over the years we've had many lovely experiences with people who just were lonely, just needed people to be in their life you know or, were widowed or mm -hmm, were mm -hmm. lonely or were in a sexless marriage or something you know just innumerable reasons why people sort of knock on our door mm -hmm. yeah i mean just to connect like this part of the conversation with our earlier part of the conversation about parenting it's like we got into this work because we wanted to spend more time with our kids and because we were tired 
of working 40 hours a week and commuting and doing all this stuff and working in that capitalist grind. And we're like, this is, there's gotta be something better than this, you know? And so we like sat to, with each other and we just like mused and we're like, what can we do? Like, what skills do we have that could enable us to make more money using less time so that we can live more life? Mm-hmm. Is basically mm-hmm. what it was. And we were already, you know, queer, kinky people. And we're like, well, let's be pro dons, you know? And we were both quite good at it, you know? And we, we brought different skills to the table and we're, we have different personalities and, you know, we can work together as well in that space. And then as Cameron mentioned, there came a point where it was like, oh, we love this work, but this type of sex work is a little laborious sometimes, a little mm. laborious. And we just wanted to show up and be our authentic selves. And so people come to us for many different reasons. They want to explore some part of themselves that they can't explore in the rest of their life. Or maybe they don't have access to sensuality in their marriage. And like, they don't know how to talk about that with their Mm. partner, you know, Mm -hmm. or like we had a, a client who had a long time like they met later in life they were together for a long time they did a lot of sensual erotic experimentation and they had such a beautiful relationship and then and then she died and he Mm. missed he didn't have i mean he was he was too old to just be able to like go to a kink club and like say hey i want to have a scene or an experience with somebody Mm -hmm. and so he came to us and he said like this is my situations is so incredibly vulnerable and it was such an honor to work with him and um you know after it he was just like oh my god he's like like thank you so much like i've been missing that this entire time like since she died i have been missing this mm-hmm. and it like connected him to the to her me- her living memory mm-hmm. you know? and it was just so i mean People come to us for all different reasons and we do all sorts of different things with different people. But I think what we provide people with is connection, the opportunity for authenticity and the opportunity for pleasurable embodiment, which Mm. our society does not support. Yeah. I, I love hearing you kind of describe what some of your clients are like, because I think a lot of people have this idea that people who seek out, um, you know, your services would be these like perverted, you know, yes. men who are cheating on their wives and, you know, like just whatever. But a lot of them are, are people who, like you said, are, are vulnerable, who are really missing what is an integral part of, of life for everybody. And that, and that's intimacy and, and not everybody, you know, it's not an easy thing for a lot of people to find. And from my experience talking to a lot of sex workers, it's just been an incredible learning experience. And these stories that you hear about, you know, how you really um, help provide for people who are, are, are really aching and missing that this have a big hole in their life because of losing a wife or Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And it really Mm -hmm. makes you see that it's, it's definitely like a form of therapy without a doubt. And it would just be really wonderful for people to kind of start to acknowledge it in that way. Um, do you have any particularly, I mean, that story that you just told is, is really touching, but are there any other clients, any other experiences that you've had that have really made you go home and think to yourself like, wow, we are really like making a difference in people's lives and made you feel really like, good about what you do? Yeah, I mean, we have... You have a whole book of them, to be honest. Um, and yeah, it's trying to be as as benign and I don't know, just like not pointing out, heaven forbid, like one of our clients hears this thing and is like, "You're talking about me." <laughs> oh my right, 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 right. Um, but every one of them has been, to be honest, like there's something, there's like a nugget we pull out of every one of them. And mm-hmm. I don't want to like pass that off as like the explanation, but um, the other thing that I, I think 
we haven't talked about before is like how monogamous couples come to us sometimes Mm -hmm. or one or the other of us and you know speaking about the fact that you know we're we're a polyamorous couple we've been a polyamorous couple before we met like we we've just been polyamorous people and that's helped our ability to be sex workers in relationship with each other but also many people have seen us one or the other or both of us as as ways to kind of question their monogamy question Mm -hmm. their sexuality and it's so much easier than going on grinder than going on fet life or whatever to try to find some random person that you can trust and hold and knows because most of those people are not professionals and i will hold very deeply and i think riley would as well like we are professionals at this work and we're not going to harm you Mm -hmm. we're We're here for you for whatever you need and so we do get a lot of reach outs from folks who are sexuality and or gender questioning you know somewhere in the middle where they don't really have another place to go that they could feel safe that they know they could have like a one-off experience to see does this make sense for me does is this where i want to be and actually evaluate that like in a container that is wholesome and boundaried Mm. and limited you know for the best of everyone's interest it's just we're here Mm -hmm. and we'll support you and 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 some people have had like lovely mind-blowing experiences like you know there will be like for instance, a husband and a wife who meets one or the other of us and they're just like, whoa, you know, and like that blows out their whole experience of like one or the other of their bisexuality Mm -hmm. or their trauma or their queerness. And it's really beautiful, actually. And that's something special that like we don't necessarily advertise on a website but people who are looking in that space know where to look. They know where to tap in. And for whatever reason, they've found us. Yeah. And it's been a really lovely experience yeah. to be able to escort multiple people through through experiences of that. Yeah, working with couples is so interesting because there's so many different dynamics going on, right? Like if you've ever had like a threesome or something like that, right? Like there's just a lot going, there can be a lot going on, you know, depending on what every person is bringing to the table or what they want to experience in it. And one person, as Cameron mentioned, might be questioning their sexuality. Like other people might be, Um, trying to see like, oh, what would non-monogamy look like in a, but knowing that like the experience has a beginning, a middle and an end. And if like, we don't like it, it doesn't have to happen again. You know, like we don't have to like break it off with this person or, you know, like it's, it's so much less complicated. And um, I think it's a great asset for people who want to explore yeah, I like that we've uh, swerved into the um, polyamorous lane because that's something I definitely wanted to ask you guys about. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick commercial break. Okay. So um, hang in there, guys. We'll be right back. Adam and Eve is your one-stop shop for everything sexy. Use code HOLLY to get 10 free gifts plus free shipping with any purchase. That's adameve.com. Use code HOLLY for 10 free gifts plus free shipping. All right, everybody, we are back. So Cameron and Riley, let's talk a little bit about you two as a couple, how you guys met, how um, you cultivated this relationship that allows you to be committed to each other, be parents together, but also be non-monogamous. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we met many years ago 
actually at a spiritual retreat, <laughs> which sounds super woo. Yeah. But uh, we we went there because we didn't care anything about besides ourselves and basically ended up like walking backwards and bumping into each other. And we're like, oh, who are you? Here you are. Oh, wait, where the hell have you been the rest of my whole life? <laughs> <laughs> it, it felt like we had missed each other for a hundred years. Wow. And yet didn't know who the hell the person was in front of us. And yeah. so we're still cultivating a relationship like yeah. on this plane. But yeah. yeah. It, it was so fascinating. So it's like, it was, it was a, like a seven day kind of like spiritual retreat where it's a, it, it, there's a tight knit community. And so we met and then, you know, we'd be sitting at the dinner table with other people and they'd be like, Oh, did you come together? Like, God, God, said, how long have you guys been together? And we'd be like, how long do you think? And they're like, oh, I don't know, 10 years, eight years, five years. And we'd be like two days. <laughs> we actually just we actually just met we we're actually just you know finding out and um it was from that it, it was on from there like it was one of those experiences where it was like we recognized each other like even though we had separate lives we lived like very far apart we lived long distance we dated long distance at first like we had other partners at the time um, but we went into the relationship with the explicit commitment to practicing relate what we would call a relationship anarchy is a very particular form of um, polyamory. So we went into it saying, this is what we want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I think that that's really supported our capacity to be sex workers and to like hold whatever experiences the other person has, you know, cause what, what happens is let's say we work individually, like one of us will go to work, one of us will stay home and parent or hang out. And then um, they'll come home. And because we're both polyamorous and the other person's a sex worker, like we sit down and we deb debrief every time and be like, how was that for you? Like, what happened how to go like do you need any support and like we can hold it for the other person from a place of knowing which is different from just like just listening you know yeah and also i think it's like recognized by a lot of our clients because you know in this day and age where we're like sort of advertising together as a couple and or as you know, solo people, people are like, how do you work? How do you work? You know, they don't have the terms for it, but they'll like be like, how do you work with your wife? How is this possible? And, and we just are like, we've been doing this our whole relationship, actually. Like, it's okay. And people's minds are blown just by the fact that we can work together and or separate and or in some combo they're in. And it's okay because we love each other and we understand the work that we're doing. Work and we work. know that there's yeah. always a warm meal on the stove when someone comes home and we see it like both in the level of sacredness that it is, as well as, as is just we don't have three thousand partners. No. We might not have that many parents. clients, but like <laughs> there's no way. Know, it's um because <laughs> a lot of our clients are are pseudo monogamous, I would say. Um they have a wife back home and that's fine. But yeah. uh we can hold them where they are and they just can't understand how. Or just it just blow, it, Why? It blows like, them open they, there's somehow. There's so much. Yeah, they're like, how can you do this work yeah. with each other? Yeah. How can you be so spiritual and be in a relationship and know that each other are doing this work? Yeah, we had one client um, in New Orleans who 
saw both of us individually, but we hadn't really started advertising ourselves as a couple yet. We hadn't really come out yet. And so he's, he saw me first and, you know, we were doing small chat and I was telling him, you know, some details about our life still being, you know, somewhat uh, discreet and safe about the, the information about our life. And then had a date with Cameron who told some of the same details. And he was like, wait, 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 wait. He put it together himself. He was just like, wait. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like together. And he was just like, what? Like, how on earth is this even a thing? Like, how is that? How is that possible? How do you trust your one? How do you trust your partner to like be out and having intimate experiences of someone else, but also like they're doing it too and you do it together. And he, he's just like, he was like, he was very articulate. And then he was all, all of a sudden he was very speechless. <laughs> it was a pretty amazing experience. It was like our first coming out. And I think it was after that, that we kind of were like, eh, we could probably yeah, tell I mean, people. We might as well make a website together because <laughs> we used to have our own each individually. I think, yeah. I mean, you know, we're so uh, caught up in the, monogamy rut and the idea that a monogamous relationship is the only kind of relationship anyone can have that the idea of meeting a couple who's been together for a long time who also like has a very domestic lifestyle and can be polyamorous just blows people's minds i mean i speak from an experience of i'm in a monogamous relationship with my husband and i'm not interested in in being polyamorous and that's fine. But my parents were, my parents were swingers and, you know, there was never any question that they were only really meant for each other. They just enjoyed enjoying other people as well. And so it's not weird to me, even though it's not a, a, a experience or a kind of relationship that, that I could, um, you know, have, I like, it, it's not strange to me that other people could have it, but a lot of people who do listen to this podcast are always fascinated by people who are non-monogamous. So do you guys ever experience any jealousy, any insecurity? And if that does come up, how do you handle that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that's, I'm glad that you segued into that. Cause I was going to say like, it's not without work. Like polyamory is, of any kind is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> you know like like if you don't like talking or if talking or intimacy is difficult for you in relationship like poly might not be for you you know like the people think i think on the outside that it means like oh you just like go and like got to get to have lots of boyfriends or girlfriends or get to have a lot of sex and it's really easy and it's like it's not like that at all you know it's a lot of talking it's a lot of excavation it's a lot of shadow work it's a lot of building trust and um and the same is true of sex work you know like we we had to do it for both you know we for me um you know i've experienced a lot of really challenging things in my life especially when i was a young person which makes has made trust in relationship hard for me even mm -hmm. if the person is entirely trustworthy like cameron is like the most trustworthy person that i've ever met you know, and yet that historical stuff will come forward, you know, and it comes forward, whether it's in, around polyamory and actual relationships, and it even comes forward sometimes like when Cameron goes to work, you know, and what it does is it gives me the opportunity to develop the skills of reparenting and like settling the parts of me that are like, oh my God, are they going to come back? Oh my God, do they still love me? Like, oh my God, it's like, and it's just it's funny because like yeah, they come back I've and they always come back yeah well I've they always, always come back. back they tell me the story and then all the feelings are gone like i'm just like oh okay you're right 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 it's just work or like oh right yeah you went on a date and it's cool and like you still love me and like here we are in our life i guess we should probably make dinner for the kids or something <laughs> Yeah, one thing I've definitely noticed from my experience of, you know, working with uh, polyamorous people or swingers or what have you is the incredible level of communication between the couple, which I think is 
probably a lot of people lack in their relationships. And I think that that's a huge downfall in a lot of relationships is the fact that people don't communicate. So, um, you know, the way that you guys have constructed your relationship, you know, forces, as you said, this level of communication that probably keeps you guys, um, honest with each other and keeps you guys, it's almost like the glue that holds you guys together in a way, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there, there, I mean, certainly in our work life, first and foremost, because that's how we keep a roof over our head, right? Mm. Um, that comes up, but even in our personal life, we have to have a level of honesty and disclosure and just, you know, there's been times when we've been like sitting at a bar before and been like, that dude's hot. And then we both be like, yeah, he's hot, you know, like, and like, I don't feel like most couples could really like share that it's intimacy really with each other. Like, you should try it <laughs> because you know, like regardless, like I know it, it's easier maybe for us because of our queerness and like our gender fluidity and ways in which we can see certain archetypes of people as hot. Um, so that's like a practice we have of just like being out in places and being like, oh, that person's hot. And then we both be like, yeah, we agree. We're not going to do anything about it, but like, we, we just will. see it, <laughs> you know, or, or maybe whatever. we will, like, who knows? But it's, it's, it's just not, I think there's like, I've been in cishet monogamous relationships before in my life and it is not easy because I feel like there has to be a level of like secrecy mm. when you, when you watch porn when you see somebody on the street who you find attractive and, and in that paradigm, there's really not a lot of ways you can bring your actual feelings to the table and have it be celebrated by your partner, which is the hardest part about a relationship style like that. And I'm not saying it's wrong. It's just like something like you can still be monogamous and you can still say like, Hey, that person over there at the table is really hot. I'm drooling over him while you were at the bathroom, you know, but it doesn't mean you're going to do anything about it. It just means you're like expressing yourself and, and something is coming out of you versus being, you know, stagnant, stagnant yeah. or crystallized inside of you. Um, and so we have, because of the relationship style we have adapted to as well as like the work that we've adapted to been able to really like effusively been able to have a real level of flow around the way in which we communicate about what's coming up in our individual bodies and being able to support and love each other and respect each other and sometimes even get on the same table like yeah damn you're right that person is hot you know or whatever like show me that porn you watched last night because it seems cool you know because i think a lot of people in other relationship styles like do a lot of things that come with a, a height level of dishonesty and shame. which and yeah and shame. dishonesty shame and all these things and and that is also another seed that devolves like you were talking about earlier like communication devolves relationship but so does shame and dishonesty. Mm -hmm. And so all these things added together um, are things that we have been constantly working at not having as a part of our relationship yeah. so that we can just communicate clearly and talk about, you know, if Riley was like, oh, that lady over there is really hot. And I'm like, wait, do you not love me anymore? And then they'll say, no, I love you still. And then, you know, we go home and watch a porn together and jerk off. Like, that's how we resolve it. And it's not like, I'm afraid they're going to cheat on me, run away, do whatever. And, and, and this happens in like so many different constellations of ways to be in relationship with one another. 
without having like a certain level of constraint. Yeah, I mean, I would, there's, I would say there's so many resources out there and like some of them have even been on your podcast about like how to open up relationships, how to work with jealousy, all of those challenges and stuff. But like, I would like to say that like, I believe that the ultimate, like one of the ultimate goals of relationship is to like shed enough of yourself that like you just want the best for the other person, like mm. whatever that is, you know, like you want them to be their full authentic self. You want them to like have all of their dreams met. And some of that could be relational, like, oh, like maybe like, oh, you want to experience the other side of your queerness that you didn't get to do earlier in your life. Like if that's something that you need, to feel complete in your life, like I want you to have that. And like all, all polyamory is, is a commitment to do your own work to make that freedom possible, you know? And so that's what it is. Like, it, you know, specifics aside, it's like what we choose in how, we, how we've chosen to construct our relationship is we have made a, com what our commitment is to each other is that I'm gonna do my work I'm going to do my work so that I don't splatter it all on you so that you can have the whole life that you were destined to have and that I can hold hands with you as we walk. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, you guys are obviously a, a beautiful couple and thank you so much for this really cerebral look at, you know, being sex workers and parents about um, being BDSM providers and about um, non-monogamy. I hope that uh, my audience picked up some gems from this. I know that I did. So I just want to thank you guys both so much for your time. And can you tell us where people can find you online? Um, our website is girlfriends with an S. So G-I-R-L-F-R-I-N-D-S experience pdx.com. That's our main website. Um, you can find me, Cameron Beaumont, at CamBPDX on Instagram, um, as well as on Twitter. No, at, at CameronBPDX on yeah. Twitter. Yeah. And you can find me on Twitter at Riley Delacroix1 and Delacroix, D E L A C R O I X. And on Instagram, it's just Riley Delacroix. And so you can find us. We have a submission sheet on our website that you can send through. You can message us directly on, on social media, whether through comments or direct messaging. And we'd be happy to hear from you in any form or fashion. Yeah, and all those links are, if you just go straight to our website, if you're analog like we are and you want a mm -hmm. one-stop shop, you could just go to our website because all of those links yeah. are on our website. Yeah. Our personal emails are on there as well. Mm -hmm. So if you'd rather do that, then they're they're safe and encrypted. And so then you can you can do that as well if you just want to make direct contact with one of us. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys again. Um, you. you guys Hi, can of course follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Holly Randall. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. If you want to sign up for my monthly newsletter, go to hollyrandallunfiltered.com. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you guys again for your time. And I will see you next time. <laughs>